just to give people a little bit of background, Michelle, mm-hmm. you really got started in the second generation – or well, if there's a generation. If, is it, I'm not sure if it's the second or the third. The That's third. a little difficult. Well, I guess I'm, I would I'm, certainly... I'm not talking about the filmmakers of... so much as I'm talking about filmmaking, documentary filmmaking. Uh, well, that's a conceptual point. But um, you know, I, I would argue that modern-day documentary filmmaking started in the late 50s and early 60s. Before that, though, just so people know, I guess you had Nanook of the North, that type of thing, or, oh. or where people just pointed cameras at – Famous people. No, no. And... Well, well. What I mean by modern day is that it was Leave it a jar. technology, Leave it open a bit. and it was uh-huh. the uh, invention of these light, portable, sixteen millimeter rigs and sound synchronous rigs that really changed the course of filmmaking in the late fifties and sixties. Before that, you know, people worked with cameras. Um, And they were fundamentally shooting what we call MOS, um, you know, without sound. Mm -hmm. Mitout sound is the actual. Oh, it's a German. It's a German. It was actually Murnau, the director, the German director. FW? Yes. As I used to call him? He was on on sets in Hollywood in the early 30s, and he would say, the next shot is mitout sound, (laughs) mitout sound. And so people just coined this term, MOS, which existed up through the 70s and 80s, and Mm -hmm. now... People use that awful term B-roll. But nonetheless, um, certainly documentary filmmaking goes back to the turn of the last century. And Thomas Edison was making films that he referred to as actualities. They were short vignettes shot on the streets of New York. And before that, Lumiere. Um, I'd say some people would argue that documentary filmmaking really began with uh, um, – Robert Flaherty right. and Ziga, Z, Ziga Vertov in, in Russia. Mm-hmm. And th- those uh, – uh, Robert Flaherty predates Vertov. Uh, he was making – I think Nanook of the North is about 1919. I forget the exact year. Um, and Vertov's film um, Man with the Movie Camera was about 1926. I mean those are both landmark films and they're very, very different mm-hmm. aesthetically mm-hmm. and cinematically. Um, I don't know if people know, but Ricky Leacock, Mm -hmm. who was my teacher Mm -hmm. at MIT in the 1970s. MIT stands for meet in what? (laughs) MIT stands for MIT. (laughs) That's right. Motherfucker. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And Ricky actually met Robert Flaherty Uh when he was uh, about 13 or 14 years old. How? It's an interesting story. Ricky grew up in uh, on the Canary Islands, Canary Islands, and he his fam- his father had a banana plantation. Ricky was sent to a boarding school in England called Dartington Hall, and when Ricky was thirteen, he made a film, his first film called Canary Bananas, and he showed it to Robert Flaherty at Dartington Hall because Robert Flaherty's daughters were both in school there. And Ricky was friends with Robert Flaherty's daughters. A.K.A. the Flaherty Girls. The Flaherty Girls and Ricky Leacock were friends. That's amazing. And so he had the opportunity to show Robert Flaherty, who by then was a legend. Mm -hmm. He had already made Nanook of the North and Moana and I think even Man of Aaron. I forget the dates exactly. And they were 13 and he made a film? Yes. Do you know what I was – at 13 I discovered that my penis uh, had more uses than I knew – I mean, like, I just discovered all sorts of new things. That's all I was interested, I think. Well, one could maybe say that about Ricky, too, but you know, <laughs> um, scratch um. that comment. Nonetheless, you know, it was, <laughs> it was years later. Ricky went to Harvard um, uh, after Dartington Hall and then went into the United States Army. And he was a cameraman mm-hmm. in, uh, in World War II in Southeast Asia. And after the war, Ricky went to uh, – he heard that uh, uh, Bob Flaherty was in New York getting ready to make a new film. Louis, it was a Louisiana story. And uh, Bob Flaherty and his wife were staying at the uh, Chelsea Hotel. And Ricky went and knocked on the door and reintroduced himself. It had been 10 years. Yeah. And, uh, and Flaherty hired Ricky to shoot Louisiana story based on a film – that Ricky made when he was 13 years old, which is quite remarkable when you think of it. 
Anyway, part of the reason I mention that is that when Ricky Leacock and D.A. Pennybaker and Al Mazels all intersected in the uh, primary, it was 1960, okay. and it was with Drew Associates. Mm-hmm. Um, Ricky was by far the most experienced filmmaker at that point. He had been doing it since he was 13. Um, and, but, you know, that was certainly a critical time in, in, in what I refer to as modern-day documentary filmmaking mm-hmm. because there were several centers. There was New York, there was Montreal, Toronto, and, and Paris, and there were a number of things happening in the world of filmmaking in general. And in great deal, because in great part, because of technology, the invention again right. of these lightweight rigs that allowed, sync you know, sound. and sync sound, which allowed filmmakers to go out into the world and escape the studio and escape the liberation. Limita- it was a total liberation, and so it's no, you know, it's no accident that. You know, the film Breathless by Jean-Luc Godard and the, f- the early films of Lin- Lindsay Anderson and John Schlesinger in England, you mm-hmm. know, in the 60s, like Billy Liar and This Sporting Life and the documentaries of Leacock and Pennybaker mm-hmm. all came out, you know, um, at about the same time. Um, so it was a really uh, fascinating moment in filmmaking in general. Yeah. In other words, you can now rent the equipment, you could go out and do it on your own. You didn't have to rely on a crew the, nearly the size that you had to rely on. All of that uh, infrastructure was only available through studios before that. Right. Okay. Well, I don't know if they rented. I mean, I think they they probably bought and, and, well, and very often point. designed yeah. their own cameras. Like D.A. Pennebaker. Like D.A. Pennebaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But certainly the ability to work in a two-person crew was radically different. Mm-hmm. Um. And then just as an aside, there was a lot going on in Canada as well. I mean, the National Film Board was very instrumental in early uh, cinema verite or direct cinema. You know, those terms are a little awkward. I mean, Ricky would call it cinema verite. Al Maisel said direct cinema. Yeah, I noticed Um, that. Yeah, he he, he much preferred that. I liked – what was was the filmmaker's actualities? Oh, that's Thomas Edison. Oh, oh, I like the he coined I, the term actuality. I like that term. Yeah, that's cute. and it was that's... Grierson who first used the word documentary. Who? John Grierson. I don't know who that is. Well, he was a, oh very instrumental in the world of documentary mm-hmm. filmmaking, and he wrote a a piece, I guess a, a review on um, on a Flaherty's second film Moana in 1926, and he used the term documentary. I think it's the first time mm-hmm. that term was coined. Um, And then John Grierson went on to become a filmmaker and, more importantly, a producer at the uh, British Post Office. And he produced films for the the government, for the Post Office. Sort of like industrials? Yes, they were fundamentally industrials. And John Grierson made a film, or produced a film rather, that is still iconic in the world of documentary filmmaking called Nightmare which is really beautiful and inspirational, um, and many others. He also worked with the animator Len Lai, who uh, uh, made the first cameraless film in, I think, 1935. And Len Lai actually took 35 millimeter film and painted on it. So therefore, it was a cameraless film. And it was animation. A form of animation. It's interesting that then John Grierson, after the war went to become the head of the National Film Board of Canada. Mm-hmm. And he took Len Lai with him. And uh, so from after the war up, you know, through the 60s, uh, and even today, the National Film Board was a very, very potent, fascinating, dynamic place. Mm-hmm. And I think after John Grierson uh, uh, retired from the National Film Board, a man named John Daly, or rather Tom Daly, uh, began producing a series called um, The Candid Eye. And the Candid Eye series in Canada, the National Film Board, and the Living Camera series in New York with Robert Drew overlapped. Mm. And so uh, the, the 
camera eye was a fascinating, uh, the candid eye rather in yeah. Canada was fascinating and gave, you know, certainly there some of the first verite films came out of the National Film Board. Well, I can understand that there was this uh, growing uh, organic uh, evolution that was going on or, you know, what have you, whatever you want to call it, in, between these two countries or around the world where technology like this was available because the technology was, was moving, was, was changing and getting lighter, as you said, and sync sound was introduced, all these things. So it makes sense that that these guys would be doing that and they would create the series and, and create the films. But what about the audience? Like how, where was the audience for this work? Were they museum, like going to get museums? Well, and uh, Well, by the way, the technology had also a great impact on the aesthetic because people were now able to do things that they had not been able to do before. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think uh, the, the, you know, they were you know, very well-known photographers like uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson who had been doing photojournalism um, and they were trying to sort of apply those kinds of ideas to documentary filmmaking. The audience, it's interesting, I know uh, that the Living Camera series, which came out of Time Life and Robert Drew, they were associated with ABC television and they did 10 uh, ten films, I believe, for ABC. Mm -hmm. How many of those were actually aired um, mm. is not, uh, not clear to me because even then there was a somewhat uncomfortable relationship between the filmmakers and the television producers. They didn't really believe that these films could be aired on television without narration, right. without you know some kind of musical score they felt nervous that right. the audiences would um not know how to process right. these new conventions right but these films also went to festivals they were shown in you know film societies uh, libraries, uh, libraries and museums that and kind they of thing were, i i believe that uh, primary won a major award at the Cannes film festival or the venice film well, festival well that was and a so, groundbreaker and so did crisis right um, which came later. Um, but they were groundbreaking movies, and um, I think they did have a slightly difficult time finding an audience. Uh, but I certainly think mm -hmm. uh, Robert Drew's uh, intention was to get these films on television, and he had mixed sure. success. Okay. Well, television, of course, was mass, the mass media. I mean, it was the, I, I, and right. it was like, what are the alternatives in terms of getting it out into the... Uh, public since there would be another what year the roughly that was early 60s right so it would be another 20 25 years till there was something called documentaries well, capital you know what i mean no, like no, in no. this bigger I mean, sense no but penny baker certainly had a big success with monterey well, pop and um, that was right. that was uh, right. uh distributed theatrically and i think he had a pretty big success concert films. with concert films he kind of started the genre mm -hmm. and he also had a pretty big success with don't look back the well, film about sure but uh bob dylan right so, um, it, you know, the, the, the combination... But it was still a ghetto. Oh, it's still a ghetto now. <laughs> <laughs> a different uh, ghetto. Yeah, I suppose. Now it's there are the other end of the spectrum. You kind of come full circle in a way uh, with the terms of the sheer numbers of documentaries. Right. But uh, the name Pennebaker keeps coming back up. As you said, he has a new film. Uh, that he he co-directed with uh, his his partner in uh, in uh, life and in uh, work, uh, Chris Hedges, and yeah. together they made this re really good documentary called uh, Unlocking the Cage, which you know I did a recently a screening, and you came right. Thank you, by the way. It's nice to see you there. So what do, what what were you thinking about in the terms of the context of this film and today, or or how? Well. <clears throat> Things have uh, well, you know, things have changed radically, yeah. and in a certain sense, they haven't changed at all. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think, and this is kind of a, a conceptual argument, that in 1960 or thereabouts, again, I, as I said earlier, the the technology had such a major impact on film aesthetic, both in nonfiction and fiction filmmaking. I think now, whatever it is, almost 50 years later, we're in the eye of a new storm, mm -hmm. which I would call digital filmmaking. And I think 
the storm is so intense that uh, it's a little hard to see mm -hmm. right now where this may all go. Mm -hmm. I oh, don't yeah. know. I agree with you. I think – I think that digital, the digital world and digital filmmaking is going to, in some way, create a new aesthetic, but I don't know what that may be. Or if it is already in progress, I haven't yet seen it, mm -hmm. because I think the, the temptation at the moment is to take what we already know – which is a form of documentary filmmaking that has evolved over the last 50 years, and apply it to digital filmmaking. But whether or not that's going to eventually, um, you know, generate something that is actually very new and very different is unclear to me. I do think that um, the future, my personal feeling is that the future of documentary filmmaking lies in autobiographical work, personal filmmaking, and the essay film. Now, they're not new. They've all been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's possible that uh, filmmakers may go back to, you know, what I call the roots of filmmaking, the roots of the cinema. Rudiments. The rudiments. Mm -hmm. And um, and try to sort of create maybe a, a new and different aesthetic. Uh, and believe me, I have no idea what I'm talking about in terms of what that may look like. Yeah. But I wonder about it. Even though there are more advocacy films than ever, even though there are more environmental – well, you know, some of these fall well, into that category. But there's some more – I mean, I, I've just got invited to the Human Rights Watch Film uh -huh. Festival again, and I've got all these links to films about issue-driven documentaries that uh, are taking place all around the world, right. uh, dealing with famine, hunger, starvation, look, or just what have you. Look I, look, I think that those kinds of films, the films that have a more political edge or, or, or advocacy films, mission, you know, okay. they support, for the most part, very important issues and issues that not always, but most of the time. And, and, and I can understand why they're important. I personally yeah. make a distinction between too. that kind yeah. of filmmaking and what I call, you know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm more interested in documentary filmmaking as an art form. Yeah, and that right. those kinds of films do not contribute a great deal to that discussion. I agree with you. And I, I was, as I watched the other night out of necessity, this movie called uh, Barbershop Punk. No, here comes the word punk again. Uh, but it's, uh, and it was about net neutrality. But, you know, there's nothing in this film that was remotely, even even remotely aesthetic about mm -hmm. the, the making of it. And so they've gotten lumped together with films like, oh, I don't know, um, what's a recent very personal film I've seen? I don't know. But we could take some of your work. And, and they're kind of put together into one broad category of documentary, but they're almost entirely different. As you're, I think what, which is what you're getting at, and um, they almost should be two different categories. But one thing I was thinking about as you were saying, uh, at where they're heading, you know, this form of, of, of storytelling. As I was at the Montclair Film Festival, made a, I was there one or two times recently, and uh, I saw the series of what they're calling documentaries, but they just couldn't be. They're all kind of playing with form quite a bit. And maybe this is part of an evolution as they're tinkering and trying to figure out their, what they're trying to do with this technology and, you know, craft. I think that's interesting. I mean, I don't but know the film. One was called Kate Plays Christine, and it's about, it, I don't know how much is fiction and nonfiction, but it's this guy, Robert Greene, who's made a number of documentaries, fairly personal. And this one is about an actress, a real actress, who is, plays herself. Or she's not playing herself. We don't know. Right. And she has been hired to play the part of, oh, shoot, I'm going to forget the name of the the news, uh, what would you call it? Not an anchor. A but newscaster. Newscaster. Thank you. Down in, in Sarasota, Florida, mm -hmm. who shot herself on the air. She committed suicide yeah. on the air. It's a, it was a well-known story or made headlines about 30 years ago. And so they're deciding to tell the story. And they go down to Sarasota, the filmmaker, and he wants to basically uh, reenact. Look, so this actress goes down, and she's caught in, you know, and we're watching this, and we're not sure, is this, what is this? Is this is this an actuality? Well, look, I haven't seen the film. I saw his previous <laughs> film, uh, Actress, actress and um, right. it's That's clearly an idea that he is very, he's 
interested in. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the film, but I, it sounds fascinating to me. And, you know, I would be very curious to see it. I mean, as another example, it's one of the most... It's going to be at Bam Cinema Fest, so you have an opportunity, by Good. the way. Well, one of the most interesting documentaries I've seen in the last 10 or 15 years is a Guy Madden film called My Winnipeg. I think the film is one of the most inventive and beautiful and intriguing pieces of work I've ever seen. I'm not even sure it's a documentary. Right. But um, because it's filled with all these half-truths. Right. I would describe it as a documentary about Guy Madden's imagination. Right. And it's actually what's interesting about it is that it goes back to Vertov and Man with a Movie Camera mm -hmm. because it's fundamentally a city symphony. He knows the history of film. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a mini genre in the 1920s mm -hmm. called city symphonies. I didn't know that. Yes. And uh, Ver Vertov's film, Man with a Movie Camera, which is really about everyday life in, 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 in Russian cities. It was right. shot in several cities. Um, and then there was another film, uh, called Berlin, the City Symphony, or A City Symphony. There are several other films, and they, it was a mini genre called City Symphonies. Were and, they just sort of like well, shooting around the cities? And is well, is, you should see uh, Man with the Movie Camera. It is really one of the most. I didn't want to say I didn't see it, but now I guess I have to admit I yeah, have not. It is one of the most extraordinary documentaries right. ever made. Um, it's really about everyday life. In, right. in And it's shot... I mean, obviously, there was no sing sound. It was shot in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. There's a musical score that was that accompanied the piece. We have to remember that silent films were never silent. Um, they always had musical accompaniment. Mm -hmm. um, Whether live or recorded, right? Live. Right. In the okay. 20s. Okay. Um, I mean, even if they could just find a piano player to come sure. in. Right. Um, but anyway, you know, there is a quasi-documentary, um, the Guy Madden film, mm -hmm. which is utterly intriguing. So I like people who experiment with the form Did, and come mm -hmm, up with yeah. cinematic solutions, you know, to deal with what I find interesting problems that can be solved, you know, mm -hmm. either by the way they're photographed, by the way they're edited, whatever it may be. Um, but I am, in general, I'd say more interested in that kind of filmmaking than in advocacy. It's not that I don't think that those are important films, but or they make they make important statements. But um, you know, I don't think a film necessarily has to make a statement. Um, right, there are other uh, things do, that it can do. Sure, Many other sure, things. sure. Well, in order to get uh, funding, though, you do have to make a statement. Uh, it's hard to, to, to fund a, a personal documentary. They well, say, but I wanted to, we can come back to your response on that. I wanted to ask quickly, insert one thing, which is, I've seen some of your recent, what you call, I think, diaries. Am I right? Is that no, what you're calling them? What were you calling those? Well, I've, the I'm, things you put on Vimeo. I'm what? making a, I've done a series of short films that I just put up on Vimeo. Um, one of them are called, uh, one series was called uh, Existential Selfies. Oh, right, and selfies. The, That's selfies. Right. I like and that. the other series are called silent films, okay. which are very noisy silent films. Yeah. Um, Did you have a piano player playing uh, during those? No, Is guess, that why? I like to build lots of noisy soundtracks and Did, then call them silent films. Were you, would you say that this was in any way inspired by films like My Winnipeg then? Or? Um, well, no. I mean, for me, I, the, not that at this point in your career you need. To rely on other well, I mean, I, I like Guy Madden immensely, but um, no, I think that after I finished my last feature length documentary, I realized that I had to do things that were new and different. So I'm trying to reinvent myself, and last I'm trying thing. to explore. Hmm. And you know, I mean, I told my wife, I'm not sure I want to make documentaries anymore. I want to play in the sandbox. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing in the sandbox, mm -hmm. and. You know, I, but I think that this will inform in some way, you know, what the work I do in the future will look and feel like. And, you know, again, I'm interested in cinema. I'm interested mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You know, I shoot the films. I edit the films. Um, I'm very process driven. And um, and so this is part of a process to see where I may go next. Mm -hmm. These short films. Right. I understand. No, I understand you're sort of uh, explore. This is an explorational or yeah. an exploratory or experimental. experimental. No, I'm trying to go. I'm trying to pretend I'm 20 mm. years old again. Yeah, yeah. and sure. uh, and you know, yeah. holding a movie camera for the first time. I'm rudiments. Trying, yeah, get and, back to the rudiments. Trying to have fun. Yeah, too. you know, because you can get caught up in uh, 
and I don't even think you always are aware of it, how caught up you are in this particular momentum or trajectory that you're on. And this is the, so my next film has to kind of continue on that, but you could actually have all, you know. Well, I mean, I have been making films for the last, oh, now it's almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. Um, They're all, they were all feature length documentaries or most of them. Um, They were all character studies, Uh most of them. And they all took at least three, four, five years to make. Right. And they dealt with very tough subject matter, <laughs> ranging from mental illness to drug addiction to um, et cetera. Right. And uh, I think drug after— Drug addiction. <laughs> drug addiction. <laughs> um, no, I mean tough subject matter. Right. And I think after I finished the last film, An Autobiography of Michelle Marin— Which we did a show on. Yes, mm-hmm. Um I sort of decided it was time, you know, for me to sort of uh, reconsider what I would like to do next. Yeah, and the one before on Bogaine? Bogaine? Ibogaine. Ibogaine, uh, Ibogaine yeah, which was, is a, really was fascinating. Yeah, um, no, that was, that was, uh, that was quite dangerous an adventure. Dangerous with love. I'm dangerous, I'm dangerous with love. What a great, and what, what, what did that reference, a song or something? Or song well, no, that? yeah, Dimitri Muganis wrote a poem. Oh, He's okay. the subject of the film. Oh, I see. With the line, he, and he, which he recites in the film. It's when he stopped using heroin for the first time in 20 years and he had done an Ibogaine treatment and he wrote a poem called I'm Dangerous it's with like, Love. It's like a gift. For, oh. What a great title for yeah. a film too. Yeah. Um, and so, right. And were making all those features as opposed to some other format, was that a commercial decision? Uh, certain stories, of course, you know, they are big and kind of you need time over an hour to flesh them out. But I'm wondering also, you know, as you're you're thinking practically, maybe uh, this... no. I think it was more of a mindset that I had that I had kind of uh, developed. It just seemed to me that films, you know, were supposed to be feature length. Um, I think that's in part the reason I'm now making you know five minute films. I'm doing something that I literally have never done before, and um, and again trying to sort of challenge all of those ideas. I mean, I do think right now. There is a place and an audience for shorter films. I think there was a time where people felt that unless they made a feature-length documentary, no one would look at it and no one would buy it. Um, That's not the case any longer. In (laughs) fact, I think... uh, you know, the attention span of modern-day audiences is quite different. And, you know, I wonder if Sherman's March came out today. um, One of your best films, I might add. Not my fault. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ross, Ross McElwee. McEl- I mean, yeah, well, I know your Ross. Colleague, very, I know. Your... I know Ross very, very well. But if that film came out today, I'm not sure anyone would go see it simply because it was two hours and 45 minutes long. Um, I'm glad you brought that one. That's another, by the way, uh, real seminal documentary that came out at the time, which which was also a relatively commercial success for. No, it was for actually its time. quite a big commercial success, okay. especially for a film that was right. as quirky as that. I mean, it was a it, new narrative, a new voice um, in film, in documentary film. I mean, nobody. It was re- really wry, you know, self-deprecating, mm-hmm. and but there was a, a, the, it had a commercial appeal, in other yeah. words, and nobody had seen doc- very few documentaries. Uh, there had, had been films. Uh, don't you know, contradict. Auto, don't no, contradict. There, I won't. I don't, I'm there, kidding. Right? There had been. <laughs> autobiographical films made before that. That's sure. absolutely, you know, uh, I'm certain of that. I know that. Uh, nonetheless, there was something about Ross's humor that I think, uh, and also just the brilliant characters that he found and this adventure that he takes, which is so quirky and so fun and so unusual. So, yeah, I mean, it's a landmark film, no doubt. Um, you know, I do think right now that documentary as an art form is on life support. And then the other kind of documentary Mm -hmm. filmmaking that you were talking about, you know, advocacy films are clearly, you know, immensely popular. But I do think the pendulum sort of swings back and forth very gradually. And, uh, you know, I I don't think it's going to stay there forever. And um, so I, you know, look, I still think of Documentary filmmaking is as part of a, a, a larger genre of, of cinema, mm-hmm. and uh, and I, I 
I hope it goes back there mm -hmm. um, or more attention is placed on that once again. Um, but these are complicated and, and big issues. Um, but you're right. Right now the funding is not in – not terribly supportive of – people who are more experimental or really want to look at form or look at stories that um, are less clearly about something or let's say simply content driven. Mm. I mean right now I think most audiences really are interested in content driven films. In other words, they go and see a film about let's say um, – uh, uh, um, yeah, whatever it may be, yeah. I'm having a senior moment. Electric cars. Uh, well, and they say, well, I really like that film, or it's a really good film. Mm -hmm. But they're not saying that it's good filmmaking. They're saying that they're interested in the subject right. or the subject matter, which is fine. But, you know, you know, good films can have interesting subject matter, but they can also be incredibly well made and inventive and and, and, and be a right and and, and, and elevate, cinematic right and elevate your uh, like experience like your emotional experience yeah be a well, transcendent on well, look, some level I mean I don't want to get lofty about it but I, I know, but, well, uh, we can get lofty why not I mean good filmmaking uses, I think bad cop you were being good cops so. <laughs> you know. Good filmmaking – good filmmakers know how to use editing and cinematography and all the other elements of, of filmmaking to create an emotional subtext mm -hmm. and to really – I mean create almost kind of a, a musical uh, subtext or foundation to a film. And the way you structure a film, the way you edit scenes to sort of really give an audience an idea of – of, of character and all those things. So the palette, you know, is immense. And the things that people can bring mm -hmm. into a film, if they know how to use the medium and they understand the craft, is extraordinary. And I think we've lost, lost a little bit of that right now in, uh, in contemporary documentary filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So getting back to unlocking the cage, what's mm -hmm. your, what is your sense about that well, that works since it sort of could fall under – well, it's not an – it is an advocacy it is. film because it's about a human right um, – excuse me, an animal rights it's attorney who is trying to get certain species of animals who have a certain level of self-reflective awareness and consciousness uh, get them legal person's right. rights. Well, I think – Chris Hedges and D.A. Pennybaker did a remarkable job with fairly tough subject matter in the sense that the film is really about a philosophical argument. Mm -hmm. And making a film about a philosophical argument is not easy. Mm -hmm. I don't <laughs> think that that particular story has kind of the intrinsic um, sort of dramatic elements of let's say something like crisis which mm -hmm. is a penny baker film made in well penny baker leacock drew associates mm -hmm. film made in 1963 mm -hmm. which was in the white house with you know the kennedys right. and yeah. uh nick katzenbach in, in in alabama and governor wallace they're, they're trying following to... different stories at the same time right? right crisis they talk about that on their first appearance on my podcast yeah that's great oh, we, I mean, there it's not only uh, you know intensely dramatic, but it's an historic event, yeah. and the fact that there were cameras there, uh, you know, is 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 mind boggling. Um, but I think that they, I think certainly unlocking the cage is a very very well told story. Uh, whether or not he is a a, a character mm -hmm. um, as as interesting or dynamic as you mm -hmm. know, others is well, I, you know, I'm yeah. not quite a certain. Sure. Yeah, but I certainly enjoyed the film immensely. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it also brings up the issue that you know, people don't make cinema verite films any longer. In the sense that. If you look at the strict definition right. of the way uh, Al Mazel's, Ricky Leacock, D.A. Pennybaker, and others Fred were, Wiseman. were working, yeah. you know, in, in the in the early '60s, right. um, you know, you you were not permitted to do an interview in a very tight right. film. Right. The, the dogma said you were not permitted. Well, I was, were, I was thinking dogma. It was certainly an intense as a, dogma. As a, as a you know, as a form of uh, also as a category of filmmaking dogma. Yeah, ninety five, whatever they yeah. called it. Well, this had was, its own 
strictures sure. is, you know. Well, I mean, Leacock, okay, hey. Leacock and Pennybaker had Dogma 61. I mean, I yeah. know, you know, something of that right. order. I mean, when I was a student of Ricky Leacock, uh-huh. if we shot an interview, we would have had our heads taken off. Right. And even in that time, you know, if you were filming and a subject acknowledged or looked at the camera, you wouldn't use that material. Yeah. Um, they were the dogma was so intense that I think young filmmakers today can't even begin to imagine what it was like. Um, now that evolved and changed over time, yeah. and certainly Ed Pincus was one of the people who was instrumental in that shift, in the sense that uh, you know he, he talked directly into his own camera. <laughs> yes, at times um, yeah. he made maybe one of the first selfies in. You know, Life and Other Anxieties, which was one of the earlier films in, in the diaries. I mean, and, you know, the diary diaries were – that's a very, very uh, important piece of work in, in the scheme of things. It's, it's hard to appreciate fully without the context that it – you know, right well, in the time that it came out. People will look at it now, somebody who doesn't understand the context of yeah. the time – and they, well, they no, think, judge it differently. No, I think it is important to try to to to, to put um, younger audiences back into that particular time, mm-hmm. and it's obviously difficult. But um, I mean, for instance, in terms of ex- experimenting with form, there was a Canadian filmmaker named Alan King, who All made right. some very important documentaries, and one of them was called A Married Couple, and it was about the uh, a, a marriage falling apart. And they actually recreated oh in the God. film no way. The, uh, the, the, their marriage dissolving. And, and that was made in about 1967 or 1968. So, again, in the 1960s, people were experimenting with form in a way that is really – people have kind of lost that sense of, of spirit, I think. Now, the other thing that's kind of interesting to me is that when I was a student of Ricky Leacock's at MIT in the 70s, mm-hmm. we would have these Thursday night screenings. Uh, and, this is up at MIT? Is that uh, yeah, at MIT. And Ricky brought um, what, you know, the, the, the kinds of, of filmmakers that he brought to those Thursday night screenings were people like Jonas Mikas, mm-hmm. Robert Frank, uh, Stan Vanderbeek. I mean, what, I, what I'm saying is that almost exclusively the avant-garde filmmakers – Stan? Stan Vanderbeek Bra- and, and, and also Bra- Stan Brackett. Bra- 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 they were yeah. all very good friends of right. Ricky Leacock and, um, and Penny Baker too, I think. Um, but the important thing there is that there was a real kinship – between the avant-garde mm-hmm. and documentary filmmakers in the 1960s. They really kind of spoke to one another mm-hmm. in a way that was unusual and fascinating. Mm-hmm. That no longer exists. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, the tradition gets a little bit lost when people can shoot on their own. I mean, you don't need to go to school. Uh, people seem to be – which is, you know, it's not that that's not – Legitimate. I'm just saying, but what you don't get is that uh, context. I guess I keep going back to that, knowing about this tradition and the lineage, and and and, and just like I think it's I think it's important. Well, I do think it's important, don't but you? I think you're right that history seems less significant now than it did 40 or 50 years ago, simply because we live in a digital age, and there is so much information out there. It's There's le- so it's, much right. to look at, and so much to think about that I don't. We need. People today yeah. who have curatorial skills in, in in the world of film, for instance, who can actually put together you know a series of films mm. and then help an audience understand right. the connection between these yeah. films, right. where Verite came from, and how it impacts filmmaking today. Uh, I don't think most people know that stuff. Yeah. And We've lost the uh, vertical to the horizontal in a sense, yeah. in the sense of how. No, I think how, you're right. You know, which uh, which is, you know, like I guess a part in part what I try to do a little bit on this show is a uh, is occasionally this is great to have this conversation because it uh, keeps me honest too. <laughs> you know, I'm re- because there's so much stuff out there, and there's a there. I think a lot of programmers, which you just brought up, there's a. a financial slash commercial imperative to just 
program, all, the most possibly, uh, you know, the particular types of films in there, the latest, um, right. you know, film the, that's going to get audiences out. And um, There's also a difference between program, programming a curating. series of films and, and curating. curating. Right, well said. Um, I mean, maybe curating is a dirty word these days, but mm-hmm. curators really are mm-hmm. working with very, very specific yeah, ideas right. and trying to use either drawings, paintings, whatever it may be, in this case films, to develop an idea about, you know, how a things, a theme, right. or yeah. how things evolved. Yeah, right. Um, well, I, it's, I got to, you know, one of the things I was trying to do is bring back, because I had like Ross McElwee on the show, Five years ago, or something, well, you know, when that last piece he did about it, he and his son. Yeah. And I, I mean, he, even though he said, "Oh, it's a very," you know, he, I think he enjoyed it. And I ran into him at Cinema Eye, you know, last, and I ran up to him. Um, love to get him back on just to kind of also talk about stuff in general. It's hard because I'm kind of, you know, usually working around somebody with a project. That's why this was so nice for I think us both is that we can talk about something that when, when it's not necessarily More general. Yeah, when there's no – yeah, when you're not heavily marketing uh, uh, something or trying to promote an event or a screening. Well, I just forgot to market my film. I've never <laughs> been very good at it. Well, uh, and uh, – well, the last one you mentioned, of course, is uh, is the autobiography. Mm-hmm. And autobiography. And autobiography of, Mich- of Michelle, Michelle Marin. Marin. Well, we're going to be releasing uh, that in the fall. Right. Yeah. And um, – Right. You said you have a kind of a partner. A distributor. Distributing partner. It's been a bit of a slow process, but right. we're, we're, we're going to get it it's going. It's pretty not untypical. Yeah. It doesn't even feel that slow One to us. One has to us. be patient. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Any any other things going on? Uh, no, I'm just have, having a very good time talking to you about all these old friends of mine. Did you teach? In- yes, I do. I teach at SVA. Oh, you are? You're at SVA. Mm-hmm. So you're... Right on East Twenty Third. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I I don't even know if I knew that because I was oh, doing I've some taught, screenings there. And... Oh, I have taught on and off for the last thirty years of my life mm-hmm. at NYU, Temple, right. SVA. Yeah. Right, that's what I do. Got to pay the bills, yeah. as it were. Right. So, you, what's his name? The uh, the 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 guy who runs the department. Uh... Well, you know, I I was I was at the grad program, oh, grad and program. now I'm okay. actually teaching in the, believe it or not the design department. I'm teaching oh. visual storytelling. Well, are you though? Then you're not on the west side then. No, I was. You know, for several years. On 16th and now I'm on the, Street or whatever. Yeah, it was? No, uh, it's, it's on 21st. 21st. Okay. And now I'm on uh, the east side. I see. Yeah, I just uh, actually had Beth be on. Really, I haven't uh, I haven't seen any of her new work or she has a work. new one that's coming out Friday. Cool. About her mother. It's a personal documentary. Oh, her and it mother. Will, and it goes exactly back. I think you're going to love it. It's called okay. Call Her Apple Brug. Yeah. And well, it's I've... a very moving story. I Is mean, her, her mother's mother... still alive? Yeah. She's coming to Friday to Fantastic. the Metrograph. Have you been to the Metrograph? No, not yet, but I'd like to go. Go, if you can, I will squeeze go. in. Go to a screening of Beth B's film. I would love to. It is, and I'm going to post that show I mean, I, today. I know her mom a tiny bit. Oh, wow. Ida. Yes. And... I didn't meet her, but I met Beth, and we talked at in, in, in at SVA. This film is very different for Beth B. It's it's as close to a personal documentary she's ever made because as much as she's talking about her mother opens up, and it's hard because she's as you as you, if you've met her, you know she's not exactly um, a softy. No, but given her as much as you learn about her background, Ida Applebrug, which is a self well, her name was Ida something else. I can't remember. She, you you understand why she would be in this, as the way she turned out. But she 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 and her daughter connect in a different way during the, by the end of this this film. It's really cool. It should be seen, and it's going to be at this wonderful theater called the Metrograph, which is a still relatively new right. venue. And it's uh, they're doing all sorts of uh, refreshingly. They're actually doing uh, you know not just new films, but they're also doing a repertory. Mm-hmm. program there so it's 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 great and i know that the quad has been under renovation, renovation and that's going to open soon and they're going to do repertory right and, and the, the ifc is always very active it, and not only that but they're you know the ifc center is expanding i didn't know that they're having a, they're building an annex i'm not sure if it's just directly adjacent or behind it but they're going to have a bunch of new rooms and they're going to delineate is it the right word delineate yes. they're going to put aside Rooms for repertory, I think, unless I'm mistaken. But you know, my God, right. the uh, it's just 
we're in a new age yeah. of, uh, and there's uh, you know more to come. There's a not quite the same thing, but in Brooklyn we have now the um, the Alamo Draft House. It's about to open, I think, unless it's opened already. Yeah. So something. So we're going in the on. digital age, but people still want the analog experience, which says something. The good news, though, is that people are still going to the movies. Yeah. That they're not staying home and just watching it on their uh, iPad, but they are actually going to the movie theaters. And they're not just showing people with capes, clearly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, the, that with that, I mean, my son and I, we went to see two movies back-to-back, Batman and Superman versus Superman, and then Civil War, Captain America Civil War. And by the end of that second film, which was substantially better than the first one, but completely fatigued by superhero movies. I can't even think about seeing something like that for with him or oh, otherwise. Yeah. I, like, I saw the new Star Wars with my nephew, and I left totally exhausted. Oh, exhausted. I, lo- I Well, we enjoyed it, my son and I, because, you know, it was like... Was I saw Star Wars with my dad, but yes, it's it's big. But at least that had, I don't know, Harrison Ford or something. I don't know. Anyway, well, thank you. Thank you. This has been spectacular. Thank you, Adam.